Good evening, I'm actually not making porridge right now, I'm making a stir fry and it's the evening. But I'm, I'm thinking about consciousness still, and I'm really, really kind of thinking in terms of this, um, this is global consciousness, the newer sphere, which I was talking about in a video I made this morning. I've done a little bit more reading on it, a little bit more. It's um, the newer sphere or global consciousness. It's a set of ideas around defining consciousness as a kind of, um, well, it's almost like an electromagnetic field that permeates either the universe or planet Earth or something like that. And, um, and which allows for a direct interaction between the mental and the physical. So, like, for example, I've been looking at the, uh, the Noetics Institute, which is a, an organization set up by one of the Apollo astronauts, Mitchell, I think it was, and a bunch of other people, Dean Radin's involved in that as well. Um, and the way they describe noetics in that, <coughs> excuse me, in that, is that's it, as a, they don't use that terminology, but it is, it is considered as a kind of uh, set of principles that mental processes like believing or wishing or intending or praying or desiring, thinking about, having intentions towards putting attention on, those kind of purely mental states can have a direct effect on the physical world. Which is, I don't know, I just, I just find it really kind of frustrating, really, because of course they do. Um, but the way, the way I look at it is they do it via the medium of material, you know. It seems like a really artificial, I mean, that, that noetics principle, seems like a really artificial separation of the material and what they would think of as the mental or the spiritual, I don't know. You know I'm, I'm moving mushrooms around in this pan here by, an act, by some kind of mental process. I'm not going to say act of will, I don't even sure what that means, but there is a mental process which is governing my desire to have these mushrooms move about in the pan. But that mental process is, is, is using this apparatus, this construct here, which I call an arm and a spatula, is the means by which these things are happening. You know, it just, it's, I mean, that, that, to me that seems fantastic enough, really, or interesting enough. I don't need to be able to put the spatula down and make the mushrooms, they're not doing it, to make the mushrooms move by an act of will. Why would why would that be even interesting? I don't know. And if there's no evidence for it happening, it just seems like wishful thinking. So that just drives me nuts all that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I like the idea of, of of the mental and the physical not being so separated because they're already conceptually separated, aren't they? Really? And and kind of phenomenologically separated, they feel separate in our in our experiencing of the world. You know, I feel like there's a mental life going on, and then there's a physical life. But that's just my phenomenological experience. That isn't necessarily how the world is. I, um, I think the world is probably best described through physical means, but that doesn't evacuate it of anything else, really, does it? I don't, it doesn't to me, at least, anyway. You know, I think it's as interesting, as I say, to move mushrooms about with a spatula as it would be to move them by an active weird noetic energy pointing into the pan here. So that's that. But if I was going to um, invent noetics, and I wasn't going to use uh, these weird little bicycle tools I've got sitting up on here on my shelf, I would want to use something like quorum sensing. Quorum sensing. Quorum sensing is a term that's, in, uh, that's used in um, kind of virology, study of germs and bacteria and epidemiology, how viruses work and spread. Um, it's, it's a fantastic idea, really, because, um, I mean, you probably know this, but, but typically bacteria, pathogenic bacteria, bacteria that can harm you, they, they sit around in your body for quite a long time before they do any damage. And what tends to happen with those is that they just... You, know, you get an infection of some kind, you know, let's say a serious infection in your gut, and the bacteria just sits there, breathing and breathing and breathing. And when they get to a certain population level, then suddenly they turn on the capacity to um, produce toxins. So they suddenly all start making toxins together, and that's what makes you ill. But as I say, they don't make toxins, they don't make these toxins from the outset. 
And if the individual bacteria, the first bacteria that gets in your gut doesn't start making these toxins, it doesn't do it until there's enough of them to really have an impact, by which time there's bloody thousands of them, millions of them, and you're seriously ill, right? And that's a really interesting process. And it, it, you know, if you didn't know how it worked, you might just think it was kind of telepathy or magic or something, that somehow all these bacteria know when they're around and, and kind of send out some hidden signal to all start releasing the toxins. But it's not, it's by this process called quorum sensing. And how it works is that, they, um, is that all these bacteria do release chemicals into their environment, just perfectly benign and chemicals. Um, but what they've also got, in addition to releasing these chemicals, is they've also got sensors which can detect the concentration of that chemical in their environment. So here I am, this lonely bacteria just leaking out little bits of chemicals into my environment. Sensing the, co the concentration of that chemical in my environment is very, very low, because there's only one of me. But as I divide and multiply, and it becomes millions and millions of Fred bacteria filling up this environment, so the concentration levels of this benign chemical um, rises. And when that gets past a certain threshold, then that triggers all the bacteria at once, who are all swimming in this environment with this elevated level of concentration. It triggers them all to start releasing the toxin. So millions and millions of bacteria all suddenly switch the toxin releasing on, and you get sick, right? It's quorum sensing. So it's the environment playing um, a really integral part in that. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't require magic, it doesn't require telepathy or um, any kind of weird noetic force operating between the bacteria. It just requires an environment that's um, equipped to, to allow that kind of thing. I think the same thing happens in, um, in the brain as well, I read somewhere, I can't remember exactly, to do with um, neurons. You know, because obviously neurons are firing by exchanging transmitters across synaptic clefts. So you've got signals coming up exchanging you know, it triggers the exchange of a neurotransmitter chemical. But what's also happening in that is that either that transmitted neurotransmitter chemical itself or related chemicals are also leaking out into the environment. So the area around the, the neuronal assemblies is also becoming, um, having raised levels of concentration of these chemicals. And what that does is it potentiates the faster and more uh, easily triggered exchange of, of signals in the future. So as the environment becomes saturated with um, either neurotransmitters or related chemicals, so the switches fall more quickly. And that's one of the reasons why learning takes place. It isn't just about how, uh, it isn't just about the formation of networks, it's also about the creation of, um, of neuronal environments through a process similar to quorum sensing in bacteria. So if I was going to make a noetic, sorry to take so long, if I was going to make a noetic um, network, if I was going to allow the idea that um, that brains are kind of operating in a in an extended mind environment, what I would want is an environment that's got the capacity to kind of soak up a bit of um, some of the expression, some of the output that I'm making so that it, it potentiates the environment around me. So the environment itself becomes smarter. And, you know, and those kind of transactions, those, you know, what we think of as mental transactions that's just taking place in our brains are actually taking place between us. Because, as I say, we've kind of leaked into the environment. And in a sense, we kind of do. I mean, that's what language is, isn't it? And that's what cultural products of all kinds are. They're kind of our extensions, the kind of the environment being filled with some kind of rich chemical soup of, um, of ideas that are around us. Because our ideas aren't just in our heads, are they? they're, they're written everywhere. Everything I look at has got writing on it and everything's got images and stuff on it. You know, all this stuff around me is the, um, is the, uh, the to me, it seems at least, a bit like a, the equivalent of, qu of quorum sensing. You know, the environment around me is potentiated to allow these things to happen. But again, it doesn't require mind or thinking to be this weird, spooky electronic magnetic force or, or allow for things like telepathy. 
you know, you don't, I don't think we need to go there. It's the same as, you know, the spatula. I've now got all my vegetables in here. It looks delicious. We don't need to do that. You know, it just needs, um, it just needs a rich enough environment to, um, you know, to, to allow those transactions to take place, to allow the, the linguistic and cultural and interpersonal equivalent of, of fencing to be operating. I think, but I might be wrong, you know. So as soon as you start talking about mind at large or the newer sphere, and all those guys at the Noetics Institute and all that lot, and Rupert Sheldrake and all that, are deeply embedded in that idea of consciousness and thinking and mind being a kind of spooky field, a bit like the steam off my stir fry. But um, there's no evidence of that at all. And I don't know if we need that. I mean, isn't this stuff enough? You know, isn't the, isn't the writing or anything enough? Isn't the cultural expressions, our songs, our mimetic exchanges enough? I don't know. It's almost like the physical world isn't clever enough, you know what I mean? It, we can't be happy with, this, with, the, with just ordinary machines. We have to have something. We have to put the machines and the physical aside because that's kind of fallen. It's almost like a like a hangover from, from Christianity or something. But all that material stuff is just crap. We can't look at that. That can't be interesting enough. The, the really interesting stuff must be uh, taking place on some different higher transcendent plane. Well, I don't think it is. So there. Anyway, stir fry's done. Rice in the microwave. Thank you very much and good night.